The most beautiful part about learning is that nobody can take that away from you. Good morning everyone. I am Dr. Devangi Bhut. Welcome you to the fourth day of CD workshop Master the Manual of M Square. Now I would like to introduce our today's guest speaker. Dr. Thetra Krishna from me, from Mumbai. Sir has worked as the professor till 2017 and currently maintains a private clinic in Neville, no, Mumbai. Sir developed various risk monitoring system, which is currently under trial. Sir has also developed pediatric root canal rotary file system and primary molar excess crown kit under prime pedodental products. And the list goes on. We are honored to have you here with us, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Doug, for your wonderful introduction. I welcome all the participants for today's virtual workshop on interceptive orthodontics. I would like to thank Dr. Shobha Fernandez, Dr. Dharti, and entire organizing team of Pedo Waves for organizing this wonderful learning platform and event. It's indeed my pleasure and honor to be part of this event. I'm just starting to share my slide now. Is it on a full screen? Dr. Akanksha? Uh, yes, sir. It is full screen. Yes, sir. Okay. Today's topic, what I'm trying to put is uh, about understanding the science and uh, art behind the breathing and how does it influence the facial growth and how this information can lay the foundation of preventive orthodontics in practice. Whatever we learn, unless until we put in a practice, uh, it is never going to yield the fruits uh, to the masses particularly. Breath is a link between body and mind. This concept was long back discovered <clears throat> and has been well documented in our Indian culture. The first evidences of this connection has been well documented in Rig and Ajurveda way back seven to 8,000 years. And in time it was well practiced and as anything ages, this science also got lost. And until 2,500 years back, a Avatar Purush, Gautama Buddha, rediscovered these concepts back and documented again in his treatise of Science of Breath. It's the world's first documented science uh, and a treatise written on breathing alone. It is called as Anapana Sutra or Anapana Stutta, in, which in time became the foundations of a new religion called as Buddhism. So with basic with this basic introduction of impact of how breathing influences human body, which has been so well studied in the past, we progress towards today's presentation contents. Since there have been already many talks and speakers on this subject in the uh, earlier sessions of Pedo Wave, I'm limiting this to in a flow where it will end up with how to get a preventive protocol in pediatric practice in context with orthodontics. So we'll be briefly understanding how a nasal and mouth breathing are interconnected and they sometimes the shift influences the tongue posture and which in turn ends up in little bit in significantly influencing the mid face growth and development, which is shown as an outcome as a malaline teeth. In general, this shift does influence the whole body, first starting with the sleep, which is least recognized, and uh, it and various postures and uh, the whole physiology of the body also, this shift influences. And we'll be ending with how to identify early signs of mouth breathing, especially in age group three, four, five years, which is that point of time, if ever the prevention is implemented, we can have any if entire generation of uh, children with no malocclusion at all. 
because by age five the direction is set and becomes an irreversible process so if you want to implement a preventive orthodontics you have to implement at this small tender age group so that's why i'm focusing more on what to search in this small infancy to early childhood that time what to see and uh, what signs and symptoms does manifest and how to intercept it we'll be ending with how this science uh, can uh, can give a, at least a management methods using alternative medicines other than what we have already in the allopathy how to implement this and lead a path of uh, a good life by breathing from nose alone that's my goal of today's uh, presentation with advancement and better understanding of various etiopathogenesis and disease process there has been a paradigm shift in the management of uh, medical conditions today that is we are entering a era of prevention and uh, that probably says our development our evolution uh, in medical care is happening the there exists today in many hospitals preventive psychology psychiatry preventive neurology preventive cardiology which are actually working so similarly we have also a preventive dentistry which is not ingrained and able to deliver to masses i'm sure with more and more better understanding we'll be able to follow the same course of medical people in line the oral diseases like dental caries periodontal diseases and malocclusions all have one feature in common that is if they are they're all preventable diseases if and only if you can diagnose them early so key is early diagnosis if you can diagnose early we can intercept and intercept the symptoms and lay a foundation as soon as possible and prevent it but the question lies are we equipped today for identifying this early lesions early signs and symptoms is a question particularly if you see in the preventive orthodontic spectrum uh, i don't think so we are so much successful because there has been a large amount of ambiguity and less amount of published work in this field now coming to if you see a definition of malocclusion also has got so much ambiguity there is a there is a significant misunderstanding even in our professional crowd about two features of malocclusion that is its etiology and the way it's managed currently if you see the simplest definition of it on a wikipedia which a general public definitely searches as a first line of understanding a subject even a medical subject it specifically says malaligned teeth happens because the teeth develop or uh due to childhood habits i'm i'm surprised and the most common cause is the jaw is small compared to size of the teeth probably no other part of the body uh this dysfunction has been linked with development so much as the definition of mal malaligned teeth so at least this definition is partly right that there is something to do with childhood habits like mouth breathing functional shift and uh, thumb sucking lip trap etc the <clears throat> ending thing is if in our practice perspective in a private practice if a orthodontist is questioned what is the cause of my child's malaligned tooth i am 100 100% sure the commonest reason given is the tooth size and jaw size discrepancy that is there has been a genetic mismatch and the tooth uh, the tooth size discrepancy has happened but if you closely observe this is a clinical manifestation not an etiology you just can't say baldness is because of hair fall it's like that so in what we have to understand is for example a 13 to 14 year old child comes with mal position mal aligned teeth he is a healthily growing child and if any intelligent man thinks well he has to question why did the jaw only refuses to follow the healthy pattern whereas the whole body is following healthy pattern so here lies the answer i always tell the parents 
See, if you see, you don't find this anomaly of size discrepancy in any other part of the body. For example, you don't find a na small nail in a bigger finger, bigger nail in a smaller uh, finger or vice versa, whatever. So I, I rather would be comfortable to say there has been a growth discrepancy, that is a local growth disturbance. And this is rarely ever seen in any other part of body other than the mid face or the lower part of the face. This again uh, leaves a lot of things unanswered. Why does this localized growth discrepancy happen only predominantly to the face alone, which is the most beautiful part of the face, which, which is the most uh, uh, adorable part of the whole body? So very aptly, some very uh, researchers have quoted that this is a manifestation of a craniofacial dystrophy. Okay, so when it comes to the management per se, today conventionally we are popularly using fixed braces or mechanics to manage a malaligned teeth, and uh, we are shifting a naturally malaligned, biologically stable dental arch to a human factored, a biologically unstable position in the dental arch. Now, how do we know this is if most commonest problem with fixed orthodontics is relapse. This again shows that if you don't un understand and address the core causes of the problem, you are bound to have a relapse. So the way we are treating it today is symptomatic, not curative. That's what I wanted to put forward. Identification, the solution of this problem is identification and correction of etiology of malocclusion. And uh, if ever we identify this situation as early as possible, prompt interception can be uh, applied and prevention of malocclusion can be an absolute thing. That's where the fundamentals of preventive orthodontics comes to play. So a simple observation of a growing child uh, there are a lot of things can get revealed. Now, as I described to you earlier, habits like mouth breathing or open mouth posture or thumb sucking or lip trap, etc. All these oral habits particularly and finally influence two functions in the face, which is done 24 into 7. One is breathing. And the second one is tongue posture and swallow. Now, here is where I want you to understand how a single shift in function can have such a significant impact. Anomalad is actually a term used in developmental or uh, embryogenesis or uh, embryology where a designate, to designate a single localized anomaly which triggers a cascade of events in morphogenesis resulting in a big disaster. Same way, I'm trying to use a term, this term doesn't exist, but it's an analogous term that a single function of nasal breathing, if it's disturbed and it shifts to a mouth breathing, you have a multi, uh, multiple organ uh, influences. This is from lung function, immunological function, and tongue posture. We'll study this as we go ahead. Coming to the first thing, why we have to breathe from nose? As I said you, there exists a written treatise uh, in our uh, heritage and uh, we already have today very popular uh, yogic pranayama and uh, anapanastuti, etc., which already is well ingrained in public, only waiting to be more practiced and implemented. That's a best, that's a good sign. Breathing is the first act and the last act of life. That means it's happening 24 into 7. To understand its quantum of frequency, it's if you say in a day there is 23,000 breaths and an average 8.4 million breaths a year, if there is a functional shift in a small way, it has got a significant impact at the other end of the spectrum, other end. That's what is what I'm trying to say. A small changes can have a very big impact, particularly when a 24 to 7 function is happening. To get an analogous quantum, uh, analogous example is if the heart function, which happens 24 into 7, is altered a very small bit also, it affects the whole body the same way here too. This function of breathing, if it's altered, it impacts, is very, very huge to the whole body. 
the 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 problem happens if the function shifts from nose to the mouth and uh, if you see why nasal breathing is so important is that when the air enters the nasal cavity it gets filtered humidified warmed moisturized and totally air conditioned and prepared to enter the windpipe via the pharynx now when this uh, this uh, that means the natural air conditioning filtration detoxification and enriching is happening by virtue of sinuses and the turbinates which the air contacts and resists during the flow in the nasal cavity we all know today the nitric oxide basically secreted by deposited by the sinuses enriches the air in influences the whole body that's so one of the uh, you can also can tell you simple act of observed nasal breathing has got uh, a mood influencing and uh, stabilizing the the kinds and thought pattern also which we generally see when nitric oxide is used in uh, or laughing gas as a standard behavior pharmacological behavior management methodology also now in time if the man if individual who is progressively shifting from nose to mouth and gets established this enrichment doesn't happen and this chronic deficiency of nitric oxide definitely influences his life in future now coming to the mouth breathing as i said you the, when the air enters the and the mouth and exits to the end of the oropharynx you don't have any of these functions so a dry coarse or cold unfiltered air enters in nasal cavity uh, oropharynx and the mucosa is not ready there to uh, uh, to um, accept such kind of air so they get repeatedly irritated and recurrent irritation triggers inflammation and prone to infection so the local mucosal defense mechanism gets activated the most commonest organ what we see is tonsil and there is actually an adenoid superiorly and a lingual tonsil inferiorly to the pharyngeal tonsils what we can see directly from or from the mouth itself so classically a chronic mouth breather and repeated irritation and infection of the oropharyngeal region triggers adenoid hypertrophy and uh, this is one of our patient where you can see a lemon sized uh, uh, adenoid hypertrophy which has resulted in tapering down a 15 15 uh, to 20 mm diameter oropharynx to a mere refill that is 2 mm so how can this be, person breathe with so much resistance so he gets permanently shifted into oral breathing and this results in a, a continuous vicious cycle of a, a breathing process in the mouth to be alive but a, a low quality of life so this is also an example to show you how an uh, uh, tonsillar hypertrophy restricts the oropharyngeal region and uh, makes it miserable what you're seeing on the right side is the normal and what you're seeing in the left side is a constricted pharyngeal airway now a simple uh, you can easily study this in a lateral cephalogram or in a cbct slice also we can see fantastically uh, the kind of oropharynx and uh, airway you can study well because the first function to be in influenced by any kind of interceptive or uh, orthodontics is uh, changing this function to nasal breathing and if the nasal airway pathway is obstructed we can the second thing is <clears throat> most of these people end up in having an hyperactive mucosal immune system especially in the airway so <clears throat> hyperactive airway disorders are common in them one of the commonest things which you see is rise in childhood asthma and atopy again again showing that this uh, there is a tons and tons of drugs used to manage the symptom uh, of uh, and immunomodulators etc has been used to manage the system without addressing the primary cause being the shift so that's why for if you can early identify this anomaly or this shift you will be significantly influencing their childhood so as i said you that anomalad what is schedule functional anomalad here also one published article talks about the same thing that how a single act of breathing results in a cascade of even 
influencing the quality of life in total for the child. So allergic rhinitis, asthma, etc., all atopy, all are related to primarily to this functional uh, or dysfunction uh, of nasal breathing and total oral or mouth breathing. One of the fantastic books I would implore you to uh, read would be the Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life, written, I think in 1850s it has been written by George Catlin. It is the first time the Western world started to recognize this anomaly, which is found in epidemic proportion. That's what he talks about that point of time. It's a worthwhile read. I, I even suggest some parents also to read this book to understand the perspective of how this mouth breathing influences the body and the face in total. So this man was uh, studying Red Indians and uh, the Red Indians never had um, this mouth breathing because mouth breathing for them, it was culturally a taboo, which uh, in early onset, the mother always shuts the mouth of the infant in a fear the soul will escape from mouth. It was their belief system, which always made them to breathe from nose, how difficult it was. And they had a more perfectly uh, evolved genotypic phase compared to any other population at that time prevalent. Now coming to the effect of this functional shift on blood, that is mouth breathing on blood. See, <clears throat> one of the, one biological parameter, if even mildly altered, can significantly uh, imbalance the body is the blood pH. And that's exactly where mouth breathing comes to a big role. They eat mouth breathing like this open mouth posture for a very long time, particularly at night, results in hyperventilation. Carbon dioxide is dissolved in the plasma on going ahead. That means there is a diffusion uh, uh, mechanism happening. That means there is a uh, carbon dioxide is pressurized and kept pressurized and kept uh, just a minute. Dr. Akansha, are you able to hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Dr. Akansha, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible, uh, sir. Is internet stable? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So the one very, very important thing what happens is that carbon dioxide is carried and stored in blood plasma in a positive pressure. So the entire anatomy of upper airway, upper respiratory tract is designed to hold this positive pressure and keep the plasma carbon dioxide level stable. If you open the mouth and start breathing from it for a very long time, you are resulting in an anatomical uh, shift. That means, for example, analogy is if you store a soda in a pressurized bottle and cap it, how it stays, the fizz stays, but if you open it, it fizz goes away. The same phenomena is happening here too. So the carbon dioxide by uh, Bohr's importance of carbon dioxide. See, we should have a proportionally dissolved carbon dioxide and oxygen in blood to be staying healthy. If you stay in 100% oxygen, we will die because in order for hemoglobin to dissociate or leave or unleash oxygen to a tissue, there it uses a currency which is called as carbon dioxide. That means if you don't have low pH environment, hemoglobin cannot dissociate. That's what the, uh, the Bohr's effects uh, talks about. So, Basically, carbon dioxide is very, very important for staying healthy in a proportional and uh, bio in biological limits when the carbon dioxide there in the blood dissolved, it maintains normal respiratory mechanism. And we all know what happens in chronic obstructive uh, airway diseases where if the carbon dioxide, in those group of people, if you give 100% carbon dioxide, they will stop breathing because they are running on a hypercapnic drive. So, in order to stay healthy, we should have a correct volume of carbon dioxide in blood and this gets disturbed in chronic mouth breathers. That's why they have a continuous entire perennial uh, uh, disease state that is. 
ill health in their in their childhood carbon dioxide is also required for preventing smooth muscle from going spasm now in asthma what happens is bronchioles get into a, a spasm and this is primarily uh, triggered by an allergen is what is blamed but we rarely ever talk about this phenomena of carbon dioxide playing a role here it also facilitates release of oxygen in the hemoglobin and it also maintains the blood ph uh, buffering mechanism <clears throat> with carbon dioxide and carbonic bicarbonate uh, uh, buffer system finally all until now what we have done to sum up all oral habits influence two functions one being breathing and i have proved various facts how breathing influence various parts of your system now after understanding this we will be moving towards a tongue posture and swallow the functions of tongue what is been well known to public is is used for taste for bolus formulation speech swallowing etc but if you see an anatomy of tongue and slice and see it shows that it's one of the most complex muscle insertions and attachment in entire body resulting in the most powerful muscle in the body called as tongue but for their functions what i have described till now do you really require uh, this kind of uh, muscle insertions that means there must be some other function other than what we have really recognized that means it looks see if you see the attachment it looks something like this cascade now that means the least recognized function of tongue actually is to support the palate because every time you swallow the tongue is thrusting thrusting the anterior part of the hard palate with a 500 grams of force that means something else is happening there so one of the least recognized functions of tongue is to it is to support the mid face via hard palate and help in development of arch this is very well recognized in conditions where this tongue is malformed or not formed the entire arch collapses as a consequence of a mid face hypoplasia we this is the evidence to show the tongue plays a very critical role in support development and the direction of the arch to the face to grow forward and broad way so the tongue posture <clears throat> is critically important for uh, mid face now how do we tell how do we tell the parent that the tongue is in low posture in a child the most common way is that we take an investigation is lateral cephalogram but tongue being a soft tissue you can't locate this so how do you locate a tongue in a soft tissue is unless until you have a mechanism to i actually uh, see it in the tongue by using a contrast medium and uh, that's the only way this is a, if you see once you use a contrast medium on a tongue and take a lateral cephalogram like how i'm showing here you will be able to prove that concept of low tongue posture is playing a role and in monitoring and recall follow ups when you take an a sequential radiograph you should be able to see this tongue posture change and <clears throat> tongue posture definitely influences the direction of facial growth as i said you with every 500 g of thrust on the hard palate in the swallow we on an average swallows per minute in a day time probably in a night time in a deep sleep too we swallow two per minute that is the frequency at which the tongue is thrusting at a hard palate now this 500 grams of force is not a dental force is an orthopedic force which makes the face propel in the anterior direction that's why if the tongue posture and swallow is correct you are bound to have a forward growing face which is a, a hallmark of a healthy evolving face now this has been long time back recognized by cartoonists they were the first people to uh, recognize that this change increases the aesthetics of face you see any of this cut all have uh, a well proportionate well developed cheekbone that is a hallmark of a properly growing face and that happens basically because the tongue is supporting the hard palate and thrusting it every time to go forward now you see any any beautiful growing uh, face will always have this one feature common apart from the rest other features which are also 
there. So this, if you see in a if you see in a profile photograph where digitally you altered a four mm shift in the first, which is on the left side. On the right side, you yourself can make a uh, uh, you yourself can be a judge, which is more aesthetically and pleasingly appearing. So, if you see, there has been a one more fantastic study which says that environmental influence on various parts of face and which part of face is highly susceptible to environmental influence. One of the most stablest part of face, which is least experienced by environment, is your brain box and the lateral sides. But what you're seeing in this picture, the green side, green portion, is what is significantly influenced by environment. What they mean to say is this part of face has got a less genetic control and significant environmental influence. So, in today's context, when I say this part of face is underdeveloping, it means it is primarily environmental in origin that is localized disturbances can have a significant impact in this place especially a functional uh, dysfunction so basically what i want to say in this context is in in the study of phase the form follows the function it's a proposed by the most famous melvin moss in the functional matrix theory Bones do not grow, but they are grown in a matrix. So in case, if you see, to sum up, for every skeletal unit, there is a functional matrix. And for example, for cranium, it is the mo it is a mo moving CSF and resulting development of brain. For orbits, it's the intraocular fluid pressure, which actually you, uh, develops the orbits. For mid-phase, it is the air which flows into the naso and oropharynx and comes out is what maintains or triggers this maintains or controls this matrix for a pa hard palate and the low uh, for the palate and the lower face it is the tongue posture so now you know why it is so important to identify this early shift of nasal breathing to mouth breathing now, is your child's face growing right? Is the first question. If you anyone ask, a simple observation of two functions can reveal that it's going right or not. One is whether the child's lips are sealed and one if the child is breathing from nose. If these two functions are intact, that means most likely your face, child's face is growing what it has been decided in the genetic or the genotype. I always say it is face is like a blooming flower uh, and in the bloom if you interfere you're not going to have a full beautiful flower visible the same way in a face in its growing age is blooming if any local factor interferes as the function then you're going to have a less bloom or less evolved face. So there is a large amount of evidence which supports that well-developed jaw is always a part of a beautifully and attract beautiful attractive face, and in these people there is almost nil or low prevalence of malocclusion. So we all know uh, that if you are a, a chronic mouth breather with especially open mouth posture, then it interferes with. This has been documented in 1890s in medical journals and that point of time they have related this and they said this is an, the quoted the technical name is adenoid phases which we are all well aware. Even today having recognized this anomaly in a developing child the medical community is totally uh, unfocused on helping them because they are not equipped with this kind of information. So mouth breathing virtually destroys the face development. This is a twins of same is a identical twins with a functional shift and by age 18 they are no more recognizable as twins. See by age four if you identify this problem and don't intercept it or parents become non-reactive to your and your uh, information you will always end up in a destru destruction of the face. You can see by age uh, in a four years the face is no more recognizable. The square face, what was there at four years, is become elongated. So, uh, it the breathing significantly 
impairs the quality of sleep. I'm sure Dr. Deepesh must have covered this in the earlier thing, so I'm not going in details of this. So one of the uh, uh, one of the significant disturbances of um, breathing and posture is that in order to be alive uh, in a long why a long face is injurious to health is that in a long a verticalization of face basically compresses the airway. In order to prevent the compression, the patient lifts the air, uh, lifts the chin to breathe. But since he cannot see anymore, he has to get the neck forward. Now, this bend results in forward head bent posture, which is a hallmark of a mouth breather, which you can see here. So if a face is evolving, the posture also is getting disturbed in a wrong way. The face is not developing in a correct way, they'll have postural errors. This is what I want to say. So one of the typical findings you should see story is shift in head posture, that is head forward, head burnt. So it has been proved that if every inch uh, forward the head is placed, you have almost 10 pounds, that is approximately 5 kgs of load on your backbone. For say 2 inches forward placed, then you have almost 10 kgs of load on your back unnecessarily and it is not ergonomic anymore, post posturally unergonomic. So, which by late 30s end up in cervical spondylitis pain and chronic pain being a depressive factor in uh, youth and in adults. adults. Why Why to identify early mouth breather I have, uh, I have talked about and uh, it is very, very important that you identify early signs of mouth breather in life because this person will have a cascade of events in disease outcome also. That is the quantum of disease will be significantly high in mouth breathers. First thing being the early childhood caries. I'm surprised the caries risk assessment even till today doesn't have this element of function shift to mouth breathing as a high risk parameter because it changes the redox potential in the oral cavity giving rise to a, a different flora which is not normally seen in the common cells of a healthy mouth. So high caries risk is one of the risk risks of being a mouth breather. Second being the malocclusion, which we are talking about. Third being the direction of face, that is the elongation and verticalization of face. Fourth being the quality of sleep or sleep disordered breathing. And lastly, because of sleep disordered breathing, they have behavioral issues too. And in time, posture gets irreversibly shifted to a forward head, leading to a definite path of suffering pain uh, due to uh, upper back pain in the future. And uh, the recent studies also have shown that these chronic mouth breathers have a reduced IQ compared to a healthy nasal breathers. This is one of the hallmarks for which a parent reacts in private practice. And it has been also proved by, as I said, you, the cartoonists were the first people to find perfect shifts in the fish. And if you see, the cartoonists will always. Uh, draw a weak-minded, stupid person as a uh, open mouth, drooling nose, face only. If you check, in any of the way cartoonist would have made the face look like this, shows reduced IQ. And this is a hallmark of an adenoid face is what I'm talking about. So how do you prevent this <clears throat> mouth breathing shift happening? First one is early identification. After early identification, inform the parent about its consequence and why they should react to it. Third one is how to implement simple home strategies before the full outcomes manifest and the medical community starts to react and take, take over it.
<clears throat> what are the signs which you should be looking for in a child below five years? First one would be a mouth open posture. In, in a kindergarten school photograph, if you take and see how many children are having no competent lip, that is the mouth lip is open, is the first thing which you should strike and say them something is happening there, face is not going to bloom well. In some people who have repeated cold and cough at that age group, will have certain features like allergic shyness, which I'll be talking to you as we progress ahead. Intraorally, <clears throat> if you examine a child, say two, three years or four years old, and if you don't find physiologic spacing, it means they are having early signs of soft tissue dysfunction and a hallmark of a functional shift from nose breathing to mouth breathing. If they have a deep palate, increased dental caries. There are sometimes parents say they breast three times daily and still child has got anterior tooth decay is a fantastic sign for you to identify that apart from the food diet and the tooth being in the problem, there is a dryness of tooth because of mouth breathing and that is a primary reason why he is having anterior tooth decay. And develop <clears throat> in also if they have a developing class two, class three tendencies, these are the hallmarks you should be very clear when you identify inform the parents. We all know that the dental arch is controlled by equilibrium of perioral musculature and tongue forces. And until this is balanced, your arch is going to evolve and develop perfectly. And when a functional shift of mouth breathing or a low tongue posture, this is impaired, the upper jaw doesn't grow and further impairing the lower jaw growth in future. So it if you find a classical large U-shaped arch, shallow palate and space dentition, it means it's a healthily growing face and the functional shift is not occurred. And in case you find a deep vault and a V-shaped arch is a trigger factor. But in, in say exclu exclusive primary dentition, you can still see deepening of palate, what I'm talking in the number C and absence of physiologic spaces correlating with it. That means that arch is collapsing. This is what you should inform the parent. At this point, it's easy to do a treatment because bones are extraordinarily soft and the child is still compliance to parents' instructions, which doesn't happen as the child enters late schooling. Now, question is, I've always been informed that spaced dentition is a mark of It's important. When I was being taught, I have been informed that well spaced dentition still looks attractive at this age. Extra oral. Then one organ which you have to observe is the nostrils. The nostrils, if you have a, if you breathe well from nose, you have a patent nostrils supported by supported by your ala cartilages. The position of your ala cartilage is controlled by a very small muscle, ala equinacea. I hope we had this Chaurasia book describing this. But I didn't know its importance until I started seeing children with mouth breathing. When you don't use nostrils for a very long time and because you're breathing from mouth, there is a disuse atrophy of this muscle, thereby which ala is becoming less supportive. So when you breathe from your nose suddenly, your nostrils will start to collapse. That's a typical sign for them to show, parents to show, so you to show to a parent that the child is shifted his breathing from nose to mouth. This is what I call as nasal disuse. So in time, say, uh, we're starting at two, uh, three, four, five, uh, six, by seven years, you can have a significant collapse like this. And in this children, they will be developing malocclusion, mid-phase deficiency, 100%, you can see. I always tell them that a nostril should be in a shape of D, that is alphabet D or a chickpea shape. But when it starts to shift to your seed, sapotilla seeds shape, then the dysfunction is happening. 
which will progressively become a flattened, collapsed nostrils in future. Allergic sinus is typical mid-phase congestion because of chronic cold and cough. There is a there is a edema and the inferior inferior palpable fissure, and intra chronic intraorbital edemas will give you allergic sinus, which is a hallmark of a uh, impeding problem in future. So if they breathe from nose and intervene at that point, this will disappear. Now, question is, why does the child become a mouth breather? See, instinctively, a infant is a obsessive nasal breather. How do we know that? Na infants can't breathe from mouth. They can only breathe from nose. This is a nature's law. So, if you, if you, they say that up to 95% congestion of nose, even then the infant will struggle breathe from nose with snore. With suffering and breathing because the child doesn't know he can breathe from mouth. I mean to say infant and particularly below two years, they don't know. But chronically, if the nose is getting blocked, then in order to be alive, the child opens up the mouth cavity to breathe and gush air inside for being uh, for a survival sake, he does that. So chronic nasal blockage, probably because of recurrent cold infections at that point of time. And uh, some people have blamed allergy and atopy too is a typical reason why this happens. So what are the alternate options for us to allopathic medicines, particularly at the age 2, 3, to manage nose blocks and these problems which follows it? The first thing is the child cannot snoot out by force uh, and clear his nostrils and remove that mucosal plugs. So if we can assist this function, it is fantastic. I have seen small children, once they see the benefit of this decongestion following removal of mucosal plug, asking again and again, please do this, please do this so I can sleep. I'm talking about my own kids asking me this. So how do we do? See, in earlier days when Dai used to clean and massage this newborn and up to early infancy, I have seen once a strange event where a clogged nose the dye lifted her ma the child to the mouth and sucked it and threw it. Even though it looks very gross, but she was technically doing correct thing. Because after clearing the nose and nice warm water bath, the child is able to go into deep sleep. They have recognized this very early. So we too can do, but we don't have to do so gross way. We've got simple nose clearing aids, which is less used. But if used, it can definitely change the quality of sleep of the child. You can use these devices, the suction pump, and we get nasobuddy, which uses the oral suction to clear the nose <coughs> because it's more efficient. You can use this too. But make sure mouth is open in the infant when you're using these devices because if you don't do that, there'll be a significant increase in the intraocular middle, uh, uh, intra uh, the mid ears pressure and ear pain can get triggered. So always open the mouth when you are doing this device use. This is the instruction you should give. This is not written in the instruction manual of the thing. But when you do this, without it, they will generally develop ear pain. Following which you can use NASA's normal saline sprays also to keep the place moist. Second thing, you can train the child and uh, parent team to do recurrent steaming. Way back in 1960s, uh, the Israeli scientists did prove and published a lot of articles on a small time exposure of steam in the nose uh, builds up an immunity against rhinovirus. This is the studies done. And we can use this published information by using a simple uh, homebound tool where a mother and child together can do an act of steaming and benefit from it thereby reducing the risk of recurrent cold and calm viral infections. Now, in place where you can't use it, you can also use normal saline nebulizer to help them to moisturize the nostrils and breathe favorably from nose. One more thing which has been least, uh, uh, which has been con uh, at our home household we have been using and nowadays the world is recognizing is curcumin. Uh, for recurrent cold and cough, this medicine has been used in most five to six thousand years, 
and now a lot of companies pharmaceutical companies are showing interest in this because these are very all viable alternatives and they have been proven antiviral so yeah same since we people cannot use raw haldi you can also use lozenges of uh, turmeric which can be given in the small children to suckle and help them develop little bit better immunity towards this cold and cough the third thing i'm talking about 2 3 years age group where they are getting recurrent cold and cough if you prevent cold and cough we are preventing mouth breathing to take over that's why this home remedies can be suggested to parents in whom you are finding this transient shift happening from nose to mouth so if they have viral infections which called common cough one of the most efficient which i have seen by personal experience is this garlic now how do you dispense the garlic to a 2 to 3 year old child luckily nowadays we are getting oil now in our time we used to it 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 we used to use an alternate method which i'll talk about garlic is a known antiviral and immune boosting properties and uh, the organo sulfur sulfur component of this garlic is responsible for it this antiviral features of this i recommend it some parents who got children with recurrent cold and cough at early childhood to use this garlic mala basically what we are doing is we are taking the entire garlic clove de clove de uh, removing the husk of it take a fork and puncture on this multiple times so that it gives it the foam at night time tight around the neck so by morning you can see a tremendous influence on uh, uh, its antiviral properties and the nasal um infection has significantly come down this is one home remedy which you can support to them or suggest to them in cases where it's not available we are also getting a uh, garlic oil available and uh, that also can be put into the dress so that they can breathe uh, during night time like how vix is applied you can apply this in a small quantity in the throat and the chest region or in the pillow so they can breathe this so the second most common thing which you should observe is lip incompetency there are some children who may not be nasal breathers they can have hypotonic lip so in uh, keeping uh, lip exercises and uh, efforts to close the mouth at this time at early age say 3 to 4 years is a very great time because by age 6 you cannot see significantly influence the length of the lip uh, by exercises so early you should start this so some unfortunate children like this full this boy is having a short upper lip in spite of being a nasal breather in them night time lip tape is a better thing so that prolonged pulling and keeping this lip at night time will definitely lengthen the lip in time and help in establishing competent lip i said the two hallmark features is one is nasal breathing and lip competency as a, a features of a well developing face so you can implement this also i recommend a 3 mm 1 inch tape with dispenser please remember it is with dispenser it's easy to administer this at home because searching a scissors and storing this thing hanging somewhere always results in uh, losing uh, the any one of this component and not able to implement this at home so always tell them micropo tape with dispenser would be the best suggestion that is 1 inch now in time we start seeing this i recently got this picture in my whatsapp group saying that this very famous athlete also has taped her mouth and breathing because if i went and checked out what is so unique why did she do this in the in the end part she says this is helping her to improve her stamina which is a paramount feature of a good athlete or a sports person so they too are seeing clinical implications of nasal breathing so if they are mouth breathing they are doing a effort reshifting so in trend it's very sensible and scientifically correct what i'm trying to say you atopy see if a child stays in uh, atopy being the second cause of nasal congestion i'm just want to brief you if you increase the outdoor activity and Uh, vitamin D intake is there because of sunlight. Uh, intrinsic generation of vitamin D happens because of sunlight. It's a very important factor to prevent atopy happening. What happens when a child plays in a, a mildly contaminated environment in the playground, etc., is 
there is a suboptimal exposure of allergens which helps the immune to steady them and develop a proper immunity so if you have the current generation that is my next generation children and small infants who are in this plus 20 2000 plus 2000 they are generally doing video games or playing at home which is relatively clean area and their immune system is craving for exposure suboptimal exposure of allergens and this doesn't happen thereby they develop early signs of allergy and prone to allergies so one clinical immunologist has given the last alternative for children to develop immunity is you will be surprised is he recommends to put the finger in the nose rub it and go into your throat and swallow it that's the only way now the child can expose himself to allergens even though this sounds very gross but he says that's the only left option for if they are not going out and playing they are succumbing to this kind of underdeveloped immunity and in underdeveloped immunity again high risk of cold and cough high risk of cold and cough recurrent mouth recurrent nasal congestion and shift into mouth breathing see the cascading event so each thing plays a role that's why i'm trying to stress on this so in during covid time there was a lot of huge cry about uh, nasal breathing i appreciate the efforts they said that if you want to enrich your nasal uh, nasal air with uh, a better amount of nitrous ox nitric oxide then you can do this brahmari pranayama which is humming which increases the output of nitric oxide from the sinuses so slow and shallow slow and shallow breathing and sometimes uh, uh, mindful about breathing or all having meditative effects compounded with addition of nitrous ox nitric oxide so currently a large amount of school programs and where we propose exercises we don't have uh, impediment like the last two generations had why we should do exercises they used to question now we know that exercise is a must and luckily many school based programs are doing pranayama and breathing exercises because they too have found that it impacts correct uh, spine posture and promotes nasal breathing so face tells a better story uh, than anything else in a growing child because by age 5 the direction is set and if you carefully see we don't find uh, food deficiency or nutrient deficiency children anymore we only find excess only so these four children who look absolutely fine if you carefully observe they have a functional disturbances triggered and it's going to show its outcomes the first child being a hyperactive mentalist push second child is a mouth breather if you can see the anterior open bite which is developing that third child is having lower anterior crowding because of reverse swallow the fourth child is having gummy smile which is a hallmark of a developing sleep disordered breathing so the take home messages is very important that your understanding of the points what i have said you today and formulating it into a scientific catalog and delivering identifying this in your day to day practice amongst young children say age group 3 4 5 who accompany your standard 5 plus elder siblings for dental care implementing this home care measures can play a fundamentally a great role in preventive orthodontics and its outcome what is a take home message is understand that what i'm talking is not malocclusion or crowding etc it is about overall health of the child and it's not an orthodontic problem and evaluating every child in your practice for the few points what i talk takes hardly few minutes can impact that childhood and since this information is in its developmental phase and a lot of efforts are to be done like this uh, cd program organized by pedo waves it keeps on happening our own professional crowd can get sensitized and this can influence the medical section too so there play, it is requirement for upgradation and upda updating your information with cds thanks for this session pedo wave and in cases where you don't understand but you sense or your blue sense or gut sensation say something is deviating don't let it go tell them to go at least see an ent and take a call on what i understand less so please go see some expert and find out but there is something happening that's what we are identify early preventive orthodontics can become a reality if you identify early and 
sensitize the parent to take the steps towards his healing. But when the tile comes from malocclusion, it means these steps have totally been forgotten and no, no more it can be done. If done all well, healthily growing, well-developed faith. I think with this, I would like to, any questions I would like uh, to uh, uh, the moderator, do we have uh, time for this? Yes, sir, we have. If anyone is interested. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Is there a way for me to unmute uh, everyone? Unmute. Dr. Akanksha, can you unmute yes, everyone? Sir. So... Yes, sir. I'll unmute. One. Anyone if have any question, please unmute your, yourself and please ask the questions. Someone has put in a chat box. One minute. How do you, how to evaluate tongue posture for checking mouth breathing? Mm. So we will read the questions for you, sir. Yeah. So the first question is how to evaluate tongue posture for checking the mouth breathing habit. Uh, one thing what happens is. If tongue is in proper position, when you open the mouth and check, we will not find the scallopings found in the lateral border of tongue. Uh, are you able to understand, Dr. Hethvi? This is the clinical findings that the tongue is in low posture. Okay. So when you open the mouth and pull the tongue and see, the lateral borders will not have the scalloping. Because scalloping says that it is in the in between the occlusion. Okay. That's one. Second one, if you find a deep vault, it clearly says it's the low tongue posture. So these are the two hallmarks for I'm talking about the age group less than four. After that, you can do a lot of examinations in an elderly sibling, elderly children, but this age group. You are going to use these two hallmark findings. I hope I address this question. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, good morning, Dr. Yash Bafna. Yes, Dr. Sir, I want to know any radiograph you can advise or anything specific to know the tongue posture which will help them to diagnose <clears throat> Uh, I can send you a video. Um, basically, I see. I say I showed you a lateral cephalogram. I hope we'll see. One minute. Just yes, minute. sir. We have seen that. Okay. In now that, that is not a miracle sign. visible in conventional radiography. This is a radiographic contrast medium. Take the powder, dip it in ice cream stick, make the patient open mouth and, and just coat the middle of tongue and close the mouth and shoot the lateral cell. I mean to say is, it should be in, um, it should be in the cephalostat ready. Only tongue is removed, just coat it and should shoot it. There's a video of that. I'll send you the link to your uh, organizers if they can send it through WhatsApp, you can see that video to train the radiographer to take this uh, tongue recording. Uh, the beauty of it is uh, in the pre-treatment, you can see low tongue posture, but if your tongue training exercises are correct at the end of your therapy in the lateral cephalogram, you can see the tongue posture has shifted and touched the palate. Okay. 
but one more question but mm -hmm. is a dynamic it's mm -hmm. not constant so sometimes when we are taking let's say then there may be again variation the, it is that, subjective uh, posture it's may perfectly change perfectly correct but if it if you tell him to swallow and hold his breath and just take shoot it's one way for us to know. i am not saying it's a full proof methodology okay. but do we have any other alternatives if not this that's what <laughs> i got an i got an alternative uh, we can question ponder on its inefficiencies ineffic but what are other alternatives as a record and proof See, being a motile uh, highly motile organ uh, we are bound to have various steps that's going to happen that's that error is going to be there it opens a scope you can use this and develop better than this and come out very good <laughs> thank you thank yeah. you for it thank you sir is there any questions yeah any other questions am i audible to you all clearly yes sir I check that i'm sorry huh yes, it's clear yes, no? sir. yes okay. sir it's clear sir yeah oh, message any more messages come Um, is there any chat box? Any messages, doctor? No, sir. Uh, the questions which were asked have been cleared, sir. Okay. Oh yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening session. Uh, okay. Now I would like to invite Dr. Shobha Fernandez, ma'am, to felicitate uh, Dr. Tejo Krishna, sir, with token of uh, appreciation. You can put on your video, Akansha. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, so, uh, so there is one more question. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. huh. Yes, sir. There, there's one more question. Um, is there any direct evidence of pacifiers that affects the jaw growth? Mm, see, there has been less studies uh, I'm aware of, first thing. But um, it is like, it is akin to putting a thumb in the mouth for prolonged duration of time. Does thumb sucking influence the jaw growth and development? If it is yes, then definitely this is going to be there. And so even it is one thing is natural thumb, other one is an artificial pacifier. If you're going to have it in between the teeth and your since the lip seal is not achieved naturally, is going to be tongue posture can be influenced by it. See, you don't have uh, uh, the child suckles and sleeps with lips shut. This is how naturally. Nature has designed. Now, if you have a, 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 a pacifier as strong as the muscular nipple in between the mouth, yes, it's going to shift. Even though it doesn't have any ingredient into it or sweetener into it, it is definitely going to influence the posture of it. Scientifically, this is a way of seeing it. Okay, someone has said that uh, pacifiers. See, uh, <laughs> pacifiers are used for pacifying the crying child. It is not designed for as an uh, uh, jaw growing anomaly. Okay, so I'll tell you. Way back in 200, 300 years back in India, there was a very, very popular third to address rob anomaly that is retrognathic condition in a neonate or infant what they used to do was that time the Britishers had bought the bottles I don't know how come they devised it but this is there in one vernacular journal the bottle used to be hung uh, from the cradle and the, the nipple used to be kept near the tip of the lip now, the child instinctively starts to search the nipple and protrude his jaw. So in few months, in this way, they're able to influence the growth of jaw. Trust me, this is a vernacular journal and it was recorded. And I don't know of any other... Uh, I don't. I have not confronted this method and description in any journal, English journals. So, yes, it used properly 
a device like nipple can be used for managing uh, jaw development and anomalies i hope uh, this throws some light on your question i don't know who is this very very beautiful question they have asked thank you sir for guiding us uh, now i would uh, like to invite dr uh, shobha fernandez ma'am to felicitate dr tejo krishna sir with a token of appreciation Yeah, Dr. Tejo, thank you yes, so much. Yeah. It was an extremely interesting session. And, uh, a real continuation of what we heard from Deepesh. So a lot of us and a lot of great information. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us and agreeing to, uh, you know, throw light on this uh, current topic that is of interest to everyone. Really appreciate your time. and uh, an excellent lecture kindly it was my uh, pleasure accept, yeah. accept thank you ma'am uh, this digital uh, certificate <laughs> thank you yeah, thank you we are honored to have you with us yes thank you thank you sir yes thank Very you much. the entire organizing committee and dr shu and uh, dharti everyone uh, it was really pleasure for me to be part and dispensing this uh, preventive information uh, because this is in a foundation step we don't have a well formulated literature we should work on it and at least since we see the early childhood uh, stage of uh, the a, a person uh, we can significantly implement uh, prevention that's what my uh, endeavor is actually and i hope this information can play some role in it thank you dr akansha it's good to go yeah thank you so much yes 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 right thank bye bye thank you sir yeah, yeah thank you sir for joining us um we will Zain. begin with the next session at 1 o'clock so you guys can have a break and then we will uh, send you the link and the timing so you can join us for the next meeting thank you akansha i think same link they can use yes sir Why yes sir will mention the timing sir once link. yes sir yes thank you everyone